Amen. Children, you are dismissed to Salvation Station. Sunshine Station is already underway. Well, happy birthday to Calvary, 18 years old this Sunday. It's a wonderful day to celebrate all the things the Lord has done. So we are thankful that here we stand on this day serving Him, making a difference in this community and making a difference around the world. What a great thing it is. Today we're going to turn our attention to Ezekiel chapter 12. And there are a few comments that I'll make, just some parallels that I think will be a little bit humorous, but perhaps a little bit appropriate as well, related to who we are as a church and the kind of things that we see here, even in Ezekiel chapter 12. For those, who, uh, of, of, those, who, those of us who are beginning today in this sermon series, we are working through the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and we've been very, very intentionally looking at what we call the dramatic sign acts or the parables of these prophets. There's some powerful, powerful things that they portray in a theatrical, dramatic fashion related to the word of the Lord through them to the people of Israel. And today we come to another one of those prophetic sign acts, chapter 12. I'm going to read the first part, and then we'll look at different portions as we continue through the sermon. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, you are living among a rebellious house. They have eyes to see, but do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Now you, son of man, get your bags ready for exile and go into exile in their sight during the day. You will go into exile from your place to another place while they watch. Perhaps they will understand. Though they are a rebellious house, during the day bring out your bags like an exile's bags while they look on. Then in the evening go out in their sight like those going into exile. As they watch, dig through the wall and take the bags out through it. And while they look on, Lift the bags to your shoulder and take them out in the dark. Cover your face so that you cannot see the land. For I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. So I did, just as I was commanded. In the daytime, I brought out my bags like an exile's bags. In the evening, I dug through the wall by hand. I took them out into the dark, carrying them on my shoulder in their sight. Let's pray. Father, help us to see clearly your word for us today and to think about what you desire for us as a church. Lord, we're just a very young 18 years into this process, but there's so much work and so much ministry, so many opportunities that we have to make a continuing difference in this community and even around this world. Lord, I pray that we would be open, that we would be willing, that we would be surrendered to accomplish that purpose in a way that would bring honor to you. God, I pray that we would never be called a rebellious house or a rebellious people, for you have called us to be something more. You have called us to be your chosen people, called out from the world, but then sent into the world to proclaim the gospel in all of its power. Or so today, speak to us deeply about what this means and how we are to be engaged in the work that you've called us to. In your name we pray, amen and amen. When I was a young seminary student, I remember very clearly working through the different Old Testament books and in particular coming to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and my Old Testament professor was a wonderful man of the Lord and called home to be with the Lord about four years or so ago, was talking about these dramatic sign acts. And of all the different signs that I remember him talking about in class, I remember the image of him in that class describing how the prophet was to take his bag and collect his things together. And then he was to put that bag over his shoulder and he was to approach the wall of the city. And with his own hands, he was to dig through that wall. And then while everyone was watching, he was to make his way, force his way through the wall and depart to describe how the people of Israel would go into exile. 
This image is just burned in my mind. I remember so many things from those Old Testament classes. I can even remember some of the things that he would draw on the board, and those images about those words are just kind of pierced into my conscience and pierced into my heart and into my mind. This image is so powerful and profound because it describes what the people of God then, the house of Israel, were going to experience. And the people were going to experience the devastation and the loss. But I can't help but also, in a positive and in something of a little bit lighter vein, I can't help but think about what this passage says to us. Me personally, as I think about the packing of the bags, I couldn't help but think about those early days of our church when we were kind of a suitcase church. We were a trailer church. We would, we would load up all the stuff in the trailer and we would take it from one place to the next. And of course, for a period of about four years, every Sunday morning, about 6.30 or so, we would pull that trailer up to the back of Central, now what's called Central Magnet School. And we would open up the back of that trailer and we begin to unload those, all of that equipment and all of those things. We did that every single day. We were, we were kind of like a pack and play, you know? We had everything we needed because we were still an infant at that point. And that image just has such profound meaning to me when I think about how God has called us on a journey. Just like there in, in this story with Ezekiel as he is about to exit through the wall. The story is continuing for the people of God. Now, they, they were a rebellious people. Several times in this text, the Lord, through the prophet, calls them a rebellious people. And that is the moniker that you would not want to have on yourself. That is the thing that you would not want said about you. And I would like and think and do trust that when the Lord thinks about who we are, he thinks of us as a people called together who have been faithful and who have desired to serve him in this community. And yes, we've packed our bags and we've moved a lot of different places. We've had worship services and ballparks and under pavilions. And we've done all kinds of things. But are we faithful? And I have to say that I think in many ways we have been faithful. Is there more for us to do? Absolutely. Are there more things ahead of us? Yes. But I'm thankful that here we stand after 18 years and we have hauled our bag wherever the Lord has told us to go and we've done the things that I think the Lord has told us to do. Good things. The word of the Lord today, kind of in a retrospective way, reminds us about the difference between faithfulness and unfaithfulness. The word of the Lord today gives us the image of a rebellious house and a people of God who are faithful. And while this prophecy today is, is directed toward those who are a rebellious house, I think we will see that there's a word for us today too. And while we may not be, in a sense, rebellious, maybe there are ways that we need to yield more and surrender more. So I think the passage today is important for us right here and right now. I want to walk you through some of the things that I believe the passage says, not just to Calvary, but to us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. In your sermon study guide, the first thing that I listed is what is profoundly stated at the beginning of this passage. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, you are living among a rebellious house. They have eyes to see, but do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear. So the first major theme of this text, right out of the chute, right in front, is a question concerning eyes and ears that don't see or hear. This is the theme of hearing and obeying or selectively choosing to hear only what we want to hear and then being obedient only to a point that is convenient or easy, that is accomplishable by our own means. The eyes and the ears, this is a theme that we find not only here in Ezekiel, but in other places in the Old Testament, and then also in the New Testament. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of Luke, there are four different places where this same theme comes back to full fruition. Concerning those who will have eyes but do not see and ears to do not hear. And the way that Jesus couches that is, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. For the one who is listening to the Lord and seeking to understand the Lord's will, let him hear that word and then be obedient 
to that word. It is a theme of hearing and obeying. And this is the constant theme that is before us individually as we seek to be in relationship with God, that we would hear clearly from God and then then that we would fully obey Him. And the challenge for us, is it not, is to be greater than the person who only hears what we want to hear. To be greater than the person who has selective hearing. There is such a humorous play on the way in which we hear what other people say to us. And there is a clear difference even between hearing and listening and ensuring that when we hear, we are listening closely to the word of the Lord. It's always been interesting to me as I've sat in counseling sessions and heard differing versions of conversations that have taken place. And you, I'm sure, have noticed this. It's as though two individuals are talking about the same thing, the same conversation. They got maybe somewhat heated or somewhat passionate, and you hear one person talk about it, then you hear the other person talk about it, and you look and you think, is there any sense in which those two conversations could possibly be the same event? It is so interesting when we think about how we selectively screen what we hear based upon our own experience and even then based upon our own desires. We hear what we want to hear. When it comes to obedience, I think there is an important step for us to take in that we hear the word of the Lord in its fullness and its entirety and we commit ourselves to doing it absolutely and completely. You remember what the book of James says about the hearer of the word and the doer of the word. Drawing your attention to that, take time later and look. But in chapter 1 of the book of James, there is this, this comparison that is taking place that I think highlights for us this very theme, a comparison concerning those who hear and those who do. And it's ultimately still a question of hearing fully and then obeying completely. That's what we are called to do is to hear the word of the Lord and to not, not close our ears up and to not dim our eyesight in such a way that we only hear what we want, we only see and then do what we think we can accomplish in and of ourselves. But we're willing to do all that the Lord places upon us. Eyes and ears that don't see or hear. Three times again, the Lord says to the prophet in this short passage that these people are a rebellious house. What a name that is given to them. And what a desire I hope that we have to not be like them. The drama unfolds in verses 3 and following. In fact, verses 3 through 16, and we'll look at different parts of this. But the first thing that we notice is that the word of the Lord is given in verses 3 and following. And the Lord gives this word, again, by the dramatic sign act. In fact, you may remember in verse 6 it says, For I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. But the Lord is intending to use the example that is played out by Ezekiel to portray his word. This is the sign. And verse 7 is the pivot point in which this begins to take place. In verse 7, you have the hearing and then you have the doing. So I did just as I was commanded the acts of the prophet. So the first is the word of the Lord, and then you have letter B, the acts of the prophet. He is fully obedient. And we've talked about in times past how it probably seemed so peculiar to those who were gathered and who were watching what the prophets were doing. And it would have required an immense commitment on the part of the prophet to do exactly what the Lord has called forth for the prophet to do. How many of you this past week had a privilege, had the privilege of seeing the funeral sermon for the Billy Graham funeral? Uh, I was working up here Friday morning, and so I did not have the chance to see it, but Jan recorded it uh, on our system there at home. And so when I got home, she said, tonight we need to just watch this. It was so powerful. And she checked to make sure that it was there and just 
in the starting up of checking, we couldn't help but sit there and watch the whole thing that was recorded. And we got every bit of it except for, I think, the last five minutes or so. But person after person talked about the importance, the significance, the influence of this person, of course, that we know as Billy Graham. One of the things that I noticed was the profound things that the children had to say about him. What an amazing thing when you think about leaving a legacy, isn't it, isn't it not true? Wouldn't we want that for ourselves? That our children would speak over us things that we were, were examples of and ways in which we were influential in their lives. One of the sons got up and he said this, and it, as he said it, I thought, wait a minute, did he just say what I thought he said? He said, my father was fat. You're, you probably saw this, and as soon as he said it, I thought, wait a minute, did he just say the word fat? And then he began to explain it, and he said, my father was faithful, F. My father was available, A. My father was teachable, T. And he talked for just a moment about how those three things in his mind, among the many things that were said by all the children, defined how he understood and saw his father. That the reason his father had risen to such prominence and had such incredible influence was because he was faithful, because he was available, and because he was teachable. I think we would probably say that there was a special anointing on Billy Graham. It just seems that there's such an incredible power in all that the Lord did through him. But those three things are very much to be the defining factors for our lives. Faithful, available, and teachable. Now, I'd like you to put yourself in the place of the prophet for just a moment. You know, Ezekiel was kind of the weird prophet, did some of those things that just were really outlandish and somewhat crazy. And here yet again, the Lord gave him this word and he had once more a choice to make about whether he a little anachronistic throw the Billy Graham thing back a few thousand years but whether he would be faithful available and teachable and I want you to think about what that actually required of him because the text tells us that he collected his things he put them in his bag and then he would approach the wall and he dug through the wall now this is not just a little mud wall that you throw a little water on and it begins to dissipate. This would have been a wall that would have required great effort and in all likelihood would have been abrasive to the fingers and difficult. Could have even torn the fingernails off. This is not the kind of thing that would have been easy to do, but the prophet was fully committed to being obedient. Now, what an example for us that we think about when God speaks, we don't select out what we want to hear. When we see the will of the Lord, we don't say, well, I'll do this, but I won't do that. But rather, like verse 7 teaches us, the word of the Lord came, verses 3 through 6, and then the prophet acted in verse 7. And he did so knowing full well that what would happen in the next point in the sermon is that there would be a lack of response. Verse 9 details that for us. In the morning, the word of the Lord came to me, verse 8, and then verse 9, Son of man, hasn't the house of Israel, that rebellious house, asked you, what are you doing? Haven't they seen it? Haven't they understood it? Didn't they want to know? And the word is that in all likelihood, they stood and watched with amusement. They probably knew what was up. They probably knew that this eccentric, maybe somewhat iconic, but eccentric prophet was trying to tell them something about the Lord's desire for them, and they really didn't want to hear it. And so the Lord then says to them, say to them, this is what the Lord God says, this pronouncement. And then in verses 10 through 16, you have the rest of the story. And it is, it is profound, it is strong what the Lord then says to them, 
And that's what the second major theme of this, uh, excuse me, the third major theme of this text is all about, the intentional actions of the Lord. And that's spelled out in verses 13 through 16. And there's two parts of this. And the first is to note the verbs. When you're doing a personal study, always look for things that just seem to line up. Always look for things that intuitively begin to flow into an outline of sorts. And so you can look at the verbs, you can look at the things the Lord is doing, and then in the last part of the sermon, I'm going to come back and talk about the movements of the Lord. But you look at the way in which God acts, and you see some really interesting things here because what the Lord says is that there are a number of things that are going to happen. Verse 13, but I will spread my net over him, and he will be caught in my snare. Now, I doubt that's a good thing, probably not a good thing other than ultimately, hopefully, bringing forth restoration and reconciliation through the Lord's discipline. I will bring him to Babylon, see what we see there, the land of the Chaldeans, yet he will not see it, he will die there. I will also scatter all the attendants who surround him and all his troops to every direction of the wind. I will draw a sword to chase after them. Goodness. This is a difficult word that then the prophet is to come back and say to them. It's almost as though he's saying, didn't you get this when I portrayed it? If, just in case you didn't catch it, let me give it to you all over again. And here are the, the verbs that describe that. And then, of course, verse 15 says, Then they will know that I am the Lord when I disperse them among the nations and scatter them from the countries. And then he also says, And I will spare a few. So what we see is that God is very intentional about the things that he does. And one of the ways you can begin to discern that is to look at the verbs of action. And to put all of that into the larger perspective about what God is doing here, I've given you on your study, God, just a few things to think about that I call the movements of the Lord. And these things detail for us, detail for us, they describe for us some of the ways in which the Lord tries to, to bring us back into the simplicity of his will and just the desire, hopefully cultivated in our hearts, to be obedient to the simple word that is brought, brought to us. Let me just read through these. I'm going to read them very quickly, and then I'm going to come back and talk about the movements of the Lord can be often described in this fashion. First of all, he shapes circumstances, which is exactly what he's doing here. Secondly, he hedges in, and I'll talk about that in a moment. He closes doors. He pursues the soul. He watches over his children he disciplines as needed. His word has its fullest effect because when his word goes out, it is powerful and does not return without accomplishing its effect. His spirit moves as he wills, number eight. Those are the movements of the Lord. And what God desires to do is to, to mold us and to shape us and to put us in a place where we understand the simplicity of his will and then we are simply obedient to that. So think with, the, with me for a moment about these eight things. He shapes circumstances. We sometimes look at the things that happen to us with disfavor. And there are a lot of things that really go wrong in our lives. We certainly do not deny that. But we also need to recognize that the Lord is at work and that there are many things in our lives that are circumstances that he has brought in order to accomplish his good. And I've long sensed that, that the Lord uses circumstances to accomplish things in us by chipping away at us and by kind of moving us and shifting us from one place to the next until he gets us right where he wants us. And I've given you a couple of passages to think that through, and some of these passages are, are directly related, and some are just a little bit tangential, a little bit connected, but you can see them. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 and Romans 8.28. And of course, you remember Romans 8.28, for all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And if we come to that place where we recognize that maybe the circumstances in my life, maybe that they are the disasters of my own choosing, but even in those, God can move me through those circumstances to where he wants me. 
Now that is a sum total of what we've been talking about with the prophetic word from the Old Testament. And that God uses prophecy and he uses judgment to shape his people. The second, he hedges in. And I've often thought about this over the years. And Hosea, I've given you the passage there, is really a great way to think about how the Lord hedges in. And the, the Old Testament concept is that there were hedges that were utilized to contain livestock and to provide separation between field to field. Now, in our time today, we use barbed wire, and up along the barbed wire fences, there grows uh, all kinds of different privet hedge and other trees, and then that begins to form something of a natural barrier. And maybe that the development of the privet hedge might give you a little bit of a mental glance at what this is all about but the hedge of the old testament was literally where they would would ensure that along a particular boundary there would be enough of the brush or enough of the hedge row to then provide separation and the concept is that god continually moves his hedge and closes in on us so that he's moving us where he wants us those of you who have farm experience or have grown up somewhat around agriculture, you've seen cattle in the, the livestock pen, and as they're forced to one side, they're then forced out a chute, and as it goes further, then it then reduces to a small chute that the cow or the calf or whatever it might be can then only move in one direction, and that's exactly what this thought is about, that the Lord wants to close us in and move us so that ultimately we have to be where he wants us to be. He hedges us in. Now there's a little bit of an irony in the book of Hosea because you need to understand what's going on there. Do you remember the story of Hosea? Hosea married the prostitute Gomer and then God told Hosea to go back and marry her again. And that imagery, that sense of the story helps us see that the rebellious people, even us who sometimes want to resist what God wants, we betray whom God wants us to be. He will constantly move us and eventually get us to where we're on that right path in the chute, in the center of his will, if we'll but yield to him. So the first two just remind us about how God shapes. But then the third one, as found in the example in the book of Acts, is that sometimes he closes doors. Uh, that happens so often in Jeremiah and Ezekiel where the Lord just shut a complete door. The Lord just said, nope, you're not going there. I'm not going to let you go there. And that certainly happened with the Apostle Paul when he was attempting to move from one area to another and the Lord shut him down. The Spirit of the Lord appeared to him, gave him a new instruction, wouldn't let him go there. And so he began to minister in another area. There are times when the Lord just, just shuts things down. He closes the door. This is a movement of the Lord often. This is a way of God saying, nope, 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 not going to happen. And sometimes we run up against that, and sometimes we run into it because we've been running so fast, and all of a sudden, it's like the glass door that we don't see that we run into, and we fall back. We say, wait a minute. Maybe that's not where I'm supposed to be or where I'm supposed to go. So sometimes God closes those doors of opportunity that he might then divert us to where we need to be. Fourth, he pursues the soul. He pursues the soul. And there are a number of images in the Old Testament, whether it's Job that I've given you here or whether it's Psalm 23, where it says that the Lord, uh, the goodness of the Lord will follow you all the days of your life. And you, you may remember, I've talked about Psalm 23 a number of times. The word there for follow is not just simply that the, 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 the word of the Lord or the will of the Lord kind of follows along behind us, just kind of sweeping up after us. The reality is that that word in Psalm 23 is the word of pursuit. It's the pursuit to capture. And God desires to pursue us. Haven't we talked about how he leaves the 99 to go after the one? The song that we sang just a few moments ago is a reminder how God pursues us. He wants us desperately to be in the center of his will. He will chase us. He will run after us wherever we are, however far we've gone. And just when you think that God 
would not follow you there. Remember Jonah in the belly of the whale, in the depths of the sea, who said, even though I am in Sheol, even though I am far, far removed, even here, God is there. God pursues us. And some of us need to look over our shoulders and see how God is pursuing us. God loves us so much. He is chasing after us, wanting us to return to him, which is, again, what the prophets were all about. Number five, he watches over his children. Second Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro the earth, watching to see those, eagerly watching to see those whose hearts are fully his. Wonderful passage. I remember as a college student first hearing that and made up a little rhyme about it. It just is significant to know that God is constantly looking over you. Last night I walked up into the bonus room and I was looking for a book to read. Uh, I'd finished up a book on my Kindle and I was kind of thinking, I'm, I don't want to pay for another book right now, so I think I'll just go see what I've got in my library. And walked upstairs and happened to notice a little green Gideon Bible. Some of y'all have the green one, the brown one, whatever, the red one. You know, you've got those Gideon Bibles. Well, this was probably one that had been given to my sons way back when. And it was just sitting up on one of the shelves. And I, I said, oh, that's interesting. And I, I looked in the front to see whose name was in it. didn't have a name in it. And then I flipped over. And as I flipped over, of all things, it turned, it turned to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are watching over those who were his. I thought, wow, what a reminder. I mean, I already had this done. I already knew what I was going to say. But once again, the Lord says he's watching over. And, and that reminds us in First Peter that he's watching over those to bring good to those who are righteous, but he's also watching over those who are walking in evil to not bring good. God is constantly watching. He sees, he knows. You think you're walking through so much alone. You are not. You think God has abandoned you. He has not. He watches over you. And then we come to the last three. He disciplines as needed. That's the difficult thing, isn't it? It is a little bit hard when we think about the discipline of the Lord. But we're reminded of that from Deuteronomy 8, 5 and Proverbs 3, 12 and then Hebrews 12, 6. The Lord loves us and because he loves us, he disciplines us. And I want you to think about discipline as a way of shaping and moving us, of hedging us and hemming us in to get us where we need to be. Number seven, because his word is powerful, it penetrates to the depths of the, the very core of who we are. The book of Hebrews teaches us that. But Isaiah 5, 55, 11 reminds us that the word of God will always have its effect. It will not ever return void. His word has its effect. His word moves and his spirit wills, number eight, as he will. John 3 reminds us about the moving and the blowing of the Spirit. And I've, I've described this before. I'll say it yet again. That sometimes the Spirit is like the mighty force of the gale. It's the, the tornadic winds that blows and just seems so abrupt and harsh. And at other times, the movement of the Spirit of the Lord is just like that constant pressure that just keeps kind of moving, keep kind of forcing you until you finally yield. Years ago, I found an old plow in the back of our backyard, of all things, and I leaned it up against the fence, and I shared with some of you this many, many years ago. Uh, and it was a heavy plow because it was made out of cast iron, and when I leaned it up against the fence, I didn't think anything about it. But over the next year or two, what I began to notice is that the very subtle but strong and heavy weight of that plow began to bow the fence out. And the Holy Spirit is something like that constant wind that is just pushing, just moving the movement of the Lord to get us where he wants us to be. So do we hear and do we see? It's so simple. I was thinking, I guess it was yesterday, I was thinking about some interesting inventions that we have today that we just take for granted I was working on my truck, and I needed to, to take a 
cable that had come apart where the plastic fitted into a socket. And I went to my little tool box and pulled out some zip ties and just began zip tying that cable all together. And I got to thinking about, well, first of all, I thought, well, that looks pretty good. It looks like it's going to work. But then I thought, such a simple thing, a zip tie. All it is is just a little plastic band with little divots that catch in the socket against another little protrusion. It's just a little plastic thing. Have you thought about Velcro? How simple Velcro is? In fact, Velcro is modeled after what we find in nature. With, uh, you've seen things like the cuckle burrs that get caught on the fabric of your pants. How about duct tape? Man, the world wouldn't stay together without duct tape, put it. I heard a story of a gentleman up in Alaska who had a little bit of a hard landing kind of in the back country, and he just took some duct tape, and he began duct taping over the fabric of his airplane where the fabric had ripped. And he flew it that way for years until finally an FAA, this Federal Aviation Administration officer, called him on it and said, look, bud, you need to fix that. Isn't it amazing how sometimes those simple things can have the most powerful effect in our lives? And the will of the Lord is so often simply before us. But when we are obedient to it in its entirety, it has the most powerful effect upon us and upon others. I believe that so many times we make things so difficult. Why don't we simplify things by saying, Lord, I don't understand all. I don't see all. I can't figure it all out. But I'm willing to do what I see and hear you say right now. And the reality is we don't have to get what's going to happen tomorrow. We just are responsible for right now, today. When the prophet put that bag on his shoulders and climbed through that wall, he was saying to the people, it's not too late. Because the very purpose of that prophetic sign act was to give the people what they needed to know to change their way. The word of the Lord comes to us today from this scripture. The Lord has perhaps spoken to you from other passages Take it at face value in all of its simplicity and let it have its fullest effect on you by being completely obedient. Let's pray. Father, help us in these moments together to come to a place where we recognize that you have put your will before us in so many ways in our lives. You have established your word in front of us that we might be obedient to it and Lord, help us to not overcomplicate it, but to just simply do it. Help us to be committed to the simple gospel that's in front of us and then to allow you to lead us into what we don't understand about tomorrow. God, help us to declutter that we can just follow fully right now and right here. God, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts today about what it means to be your people at this church now 18 years old, and to be your people through these ministries and through our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.